sleep paralysis today. Uh, sleep paralysis is a very, very fascinating phenomenon, which is uh, it's characterized by uh, involuntary immobility during uh, sleep. So it happens usually at sleep onset, so as the year is about to fall asleep or upon awakening. And, uh, it's, it's related to REM sleep. And, and during sleep, there are five, there are five stages uh, during sleep. Uh, one is stage one, which is uh, a sensation of drowsiness. Uh, sort of the, the, the senses are being slowly knocked out. And then there's stage two, which is, um, by, by stage two, the senses are now completely dampened. They're knocked out, it's blocked at this point. Going to stage two and three, where you have deep sleep. And during deep sleep, you now have the release of a growth, a growth hormones. And by the fifth stage, which is, uh, which is REM sleep, you have a complete paralysis, a gross paralysis of the body. And what happens is, we have the most uh, vivid of dreams during REM. Um, there is, uh, there is re uh, processing of, of negative emotions during REM sleep. And um, also, uh, what's what, uh, the, the brain, the brain stem, and the, the, the uh, medulla, which is the long structure in, in the, the brain stem, and the pons have a system which act actively suppresses and inhibits um, um, uh, a skeletal muscle tone, basically, through uh, mediated by neurotransmitters glycine and GABA, which are uh, very sort of inhibitory neurotransmitters. So we have a gross motor paralysis during REM sleep. Now, if you, experience, if you have the sensation of, of some kind of disruption during REM sleep, so if you have a dis disruption, so, so a, a de desynchronization of, of REM and the motor paralysis, what can happen is perceptual activity might sort of kick in and you have a stage where you feel awake, perceptually awake, but your body is completely paralyzed. So you lie there, you can't move. I mean, imagine how frightened that you're frightening that it must be lying there, not being able to move. So you lie there, you can't move, right? But also, I just said during REM sleep, you have processing of, of ne negative emotion, negative emotions, and dreaming. So that might also sort of uh, be, be transitioned over to this 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 state. So now you're lying there, right? You can't move. You're scared, right? It must be frightening. And then you start hallucinating, which is like basically like dreaming with your eyes open. You lie there, right? But not only that, there's even more complexity because what happens is you have a disruption of your body image, right? You love your, your motor command uh, neuron says fire, but there's no proprioceptive feedback, right? So what happens is um, you you get you get phantom limbs. It's very common. So you lie there, you get phantom limbs, right? And you get uh, sensations of your legs swirling in the air. You even might even have the experience of your body leaving, kind of being projected out. So now we have sense of body detached from your physical body, autoscopy, you're looking at your own body, right? Sense of presence, fear, not being able to move your physical body. So that's sleep paralysis, a very interesting phenomenon. Um, What's been found that sleep paralysis is um, they have found physiological reaction to the experience comparable to PTSD. <coughs> but that's fascinating. I mean, the fact that you have this thing produced by the brain, one could argue, uh, yet it, when you take them to the laboratory and, and, and assess some of these people, they actually talk about uh, symptoms that are equivalent to PTSD-like symptoms. Um, and also, so it's much more common among people that, are, that have anxiety, people that are anxious, uh, people with, 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 with um, PTSD is very common. So PTSD causes, can, can, can lead to more of these experiences, but it can also, the event can also lead to PTSD. Um, given, the, given the experience and uh, that's so uncanny, Obviously, it's been recorded throughout history and cultures. People have talked about it. Um, so have you, maybe the, the space, you heard about the space alien abduction phenomenon in the US. It was very in the media a while ago. This is actually one explanation for that. 
these people, when you talk to them and take them to the library, to the, to the lab, sorry, to the lab, and you talk to them, their experience is very much like sleep paralysis. They say they lie in their bed, right, and they can't move. Suddenly, they see this alien being coming down, you know, on a spaceship and experimenting on, experimenting on them, you know. So that's one cultural uh, ex uh, phenomenon, sort of belief that's that's driven by this this experience. And uh, that's one thing. Also, you know, the, the Salem witch trials in Massachusetts, Benjamin Franklin, uh, Franklin wrote about this. They would talk about witches coming in and visiting them uh, while they were lying, you know, in bed. So this phenomenon has, has, has influenced culture as well, you know, in, in, uh, in many ways. Um, one thing that's really interesting about uh, sleep paralysis and, and, the, and the cultural aspect is that um, then you can have a certain cultural filter, right? The way you process and you interpret the, the experience can be very much moderated by culture. So now if you have a certain belief about the experience, if you believe that, well, this, you know, this experience of lying in a bed and being able to move and being strangled, well, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a witch, or that's a, um, that is a demon, you know, depending on the religion and the culture, that might amplify the experience even more, create more fear, right? And what then what happens when people have this awareness and when they lie in their bed, right, and they they lie there and they sense a little bit of paralysis, they're much more alert to those those symptoms and start acting out and moving. So what you see is being alert or having like being culturally primed can lead to more experiences. You're much more alert to that to those kind of symptoms which also then activates limbic structures, amygdala, and you have, so it becomes sort of a, t a cue of uh, terror, terror cue, that you can sense in your body that you cannot move, right? So that's one aspect of it. That leads to higher rates, right? And the culture can lead to higher rates now because of the, the expectation uh, for the experience to happen. Um, also, there, there, are mainly, there are mainly two there are two uh, hypotheses about um, the, the, the hallucination during sleep paralysis, the hallucinatory experiences that might happen. One is the cultural source hypothesis. And the cultural source hypothesis states that mainly the experience is driven by, the, the, the hallucinations are driven by culture. So it's mainly culture that, 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 that causes these specific hallucinations. They explain why a guy in America sees uh, aliens, for example, right? And a guy in uh, China or Japan sees kind of Ashari demons, right? Or somebody in the Middle East see the jinn, which is another kind of demon. Or somebody, you know, in, in, in Italy sees the uh, Penefecha, Penefecha, which is another uh, fun one. Um, so, so there's different, that's one, that's one explanation, so the cultural source hypothesis. But there's also the uh, experiential hypothesis. So the experiential hypothesis which says, no, these hallucinations are mainly the same. They, all, they all, like, almost always tend to be the presence of this shadow-like figure that approaches the body. It's always the same in all cultures, right? Almost like a Rorschach uh, inkblot. And then people project their own personal cultural uh, interpretations into it. And when you look at the literature, that actually tends to be the case. We've done research in three or four countries, and uh, we tend to see that, that, that the uh, hallucinations uh, tend to be very similar, and we can also compare with other literature. So the phenomenology of the experience is robust. It's very common. Uh, one, one hallucination that's very common, as I said, is, uh, is that shape, that human shape you see. One explanation for that human shape, one theory that uh, that we suggested or we are working on right now with, with uh, Dr. Ramachandran and you know we might uh, pursue further is this idea that we know it has been suggested that in the superior parietal lobule, right, there might there, there, there's a there's a template of a human body, okay, which might this could explain attraction in that. If you have, uh, that might have a neural system which connects to visual cortex and to uh, 
limbic structures that might explain why we're attracted to human form and not, I'm not attracted to this or I'm not attracted to, you know, like this bag or even like a dog. So there might be a template there, right? Um, and this, this idea was sort of formulated in the context of people with apotomophilia, people that um, when they have, a, they want the limb cut off, right? They tend to be attracted with, to people that actually are missing limbs, so it could be a reflection there. So one explanation for why uh, people see this, this shape or this uh, bodily shape could be similarly going back to that this disruption of body image that happened during sleep paralysis where you have more proprioceptive feedback, you have like out of body experiences, so that, that, same, that same disruption of body image might explain why people then see these black shapes. It's almost like, oh, always a human shape, human figure-like shape, shadow you see. That's one explanation for that. Um, also in psychiatry, this phenomenon, so when, when you have like these clinical diagnostic tools, right, and you have patients come in and you see them, uh, this phenomenon is largely ignored. I mean, people still sort of, many a psychiatrist assume that sleep paralysis is simply a symptom of narcolepsy, right? And not, but narcolepsy is very rare. Narcolepsy is about 0.5 of the population have narcolepsy. Sleep paralysis is much more common. It's uh, 20, about 20-30% of the general population, and it's even, even higher among college students. So it's much more common than just simply being a symptom of, of narcolepsy. Um, that's, that's in terms of that. So, so also, um, we can talk a little bit about... Um, well, so yeah, so now you know... Um, in terms of this, this phenomenon is, is, is interesting in many ways. So it sort of ties in culture, the whole idea of culture and how culture can, how this, how one single phenomenon in neurology, right, can shape culture and civilization, religion, things of that nature. Yes. So, uh, so yeah, it's one phenomenon, it's, it, it sort of uh, ties into culture, civilization, in terms of how the beliefs are shaped. It ties into to, you know, how, how, how the brain, how psychiatry, how a single phenomenon can create a psychiatric condition comparable to being raped in daylight. I mean, here you have this person sleeping, and you go test him in the laboratory, right? He has the same physiological reaction as somebody who's being raped in daylight, I mean that, that's the comparison. You can have PTSD-like symptoms from one, you know, uh, condition you have sleep paralysis or these hallucinations. You know, hallucinations don't always occur. It's about five percent of the time. So the, 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 if the phenomenon happens about thirty or forty percent of the time, uh, about out of those, about thirty percent have some kind of hallucinatory experience, and then only five percent have like a full range of, you know, of, of visual or auditory kinetic. And so on and so forth. Um, and, and, and sense of being raped during sleep paralysis is also not uh, uncommon. So yeah, this is a very fascinating phenomenon. It's, it summarizes culture, it summarizes, uh, you know, uh, things like uh, the self, who am I, you know, out of my, who am I, the sense of self, the sense of the universe, you know, I mean, I mean there's a whole movement in terms of space, uh, you know, space aliens, are they real or not, coming from this single phenomenon. Um, and, and we're trying to understand more in terms of how this uh, phenomenon is understood culturally. I mean, all the conferences I go to, people come up to me and, and you know, talk about how this experience influenced them, you know, and, and how this, uh, how that specific phenomenon has a certain name in their culture. So yeah, it's, it's uh, really fascinating. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, I actually, I experienced it, and I bet there's several here that have had it, and also with the hallucinations, probably. So, um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask those. I mean, the 
there is, there is, uh, it's possible that, um, it's, it, research suggests that if actually praying, praying, you know, getting into a relaxed state of mind and less tense, you know, which praying might do to you, that could actually alleviate and, and make the experience go away. Well, it's, 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 well, that's, it's kind of, I mean, if you, no, I wouldn't, because, I mean, when you try to move, you try to wake up too, so, um, I haven't heard about singing specifically that, I mean, people might have anecdotes that works for them, but there's nothing in the literature that singing specifically. Can um, this be triggered through drug abuse of some sort? Is there a higher rate of suffering? Uh -huh. what, what kind of drugs? No, uh, no, I mean, um, obviously, actually, yeah, there is people that take drugs that uh, tend to have some sort of disruption in REM state. Anything that causes disruption, disruption in REM uh, <coughs> tend to have the experiences more. So we've heard about that. We have case studies and things like that that suggest this. Right, interesting question. Well, we've done studies on that, and it seems it varies from culture to culture. Uh, in, in the Scandinavian culture, uh, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, it's about typically two, three minutes subjectively. We don't have that, we don't, uh, there's no published studies that are not like, other than subjective and retrospective. But people say uh, mean about two, three minutes, I would say, and, 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 but it's actually longer in some cultures. So in, uh, among Cam Cambodian refugees, uh, among Egyptians, Nigerians and things like that. It's about four or five minutes people tend to believe that, you know. So, good question. Um, just to make sure, did you say that the 